So I've made the decision to uh, take the alcohols video that was there, which again, in hindsight now, in the future it won't be there, so it'll be a bit weird. But I've decided to take that uh, video, it's about 40 minutes long, and uh, I might leave it up, I don't know yet. Uh, but split it down into more manageable pieces, um, so that it's just a bit easier, rather than this whole sort of big lump. Uh, so, I'm going to look at oxidising alcohols in this video. Uh, so, a bit of classification of alcohols, the primary, secondary, tertiary, looking at how to oxidise them, uh, and then looking at how to test for the products of oxidation. Finally, a little exam question, but there's not a lot. Because I've now separated the alcohols out, it means that it's, I'm sort of struggling to find exam questions, but I'll give you an idea of sort of things that you would get asked. So, first thing, keep this quite short. Alcohols come in three classes, and the classes are primary, which you can give this little one degree symbol, secondary, and they can be tertiary. So, examples of each. So, ethanol is a good example of a primary alcohol. Uh, and if I was draw ethanol out, we've got our, we'll do it this way, CH3 on that side, CH2, and then OH. This would be a displayed formula because all the bonds are drawn. Uh, I'll do all of them to start with, then, uh, then I'll, I'll go back and work out, kind of tell you how we can work out what is what. Is what. Um, this guy here is my, ooh, what should we do it down here, why not? This is my secondary alcohol, uh, and this is propantuol. Uh, and then finally, my tertiary alcohol is going to be this guy. There's a bond there. Uh, right, and this is what? Meth earth prop. Uh, 2-methyl propan 2 -ol. That's really bugging me. Oh, much nicer. Okay. So, primary, secondary, and tertiary, respectively. Why is this primary? Well, the easiest way to look at this is, and I'll change colour for this, because it's that important. Where should we go? Oh, let's go here. Look at the carbon that has the alcohol group attached to the hydroxy group. In this case, it's this carbon here. And then look at what is attached to that carbon. We have one alkyl group, and that causes us to have a primary alcohol. This carbon attached to the hydroxy group. We have two alkyl groups, and that causes us to have a secondary alcohol. Tertiary alcohol, look at the carbon attached to the hydroxy group. We have three alkyl groups. One, two, three. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Done. That is all there is to the classification of alcohols, but that underpins the whole oxidizing or the oxidation of them. I taught a kid who, who liked the opposite way around, like look at how many hydrogens were attached and that two hydrogens meant, this is again to the carbon attached to the hydroxy, was it primary, one minute it was secondary and none meant it was tertiary. That com is completely backward to me but it worked for him, so go for it, do whatever you want. I think the easiest one is one alcohol is the primary, two alcohol, secondary, three alcohol, tertiary. What I mean by alcohol by the way is this group here, whilst we wouldn't name them necessarily as alkyl groups, so this would not be dimethyl, this would just be propantuol. Um, I'm calling them alkyl groups in relation to them being attached to the carbon, so I'm not talking about the nomenclature here, I'm talking about what is actually attached to the carbon and splitting them down into these four groups. So, primary, secondary and tertiary. Okay, the starting point, I'll tell you what I'll write. I will again, I will I'll put these notes in the description so people can use them if they wish. Primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay, so where do we go next with this? Well, our primary, secondary and our tertiary alcohols can be, well, they can kind of, some can be oxidised, some can all, they can be oxidised by different amounts. And that's a key portion to where we're going to be going with this. Now the oxidation of alcohols is done using uh, potassium dichromate, acidified potassium dichromate. And what we can do is we can oxidise the primary alcohol this is oxidation using acidified 
potassium dichromate, and I'll give you the little formula for that guy, K2Cr2O7. So we can oxidize this here, our primary alcohol, and I'll do this for, for the others as well. We can oxidize it down to an aldehyde. So what we find is that we end up with, oh, try to remember what we're going to have here. There we go. So essentially what happens is we lose water. Water is ejected in this oxidation, okay? We end up with, yeah, water, water is lost. Um, we end up losing a hydrogen attached to the hydroxy group and we end up losing another hydrogen attached to the oxygen and then the actual oxidizing agent itself provides the oxygen which gives the H2 and then O, okay? And you would see this often written as you could add this oxidizing agent being um, this square bracket O, that's our oxidizing agent, that's a sort of shorthand version. We can do equations with the K2Cr2O7 or rather the ion, the Cr2O7 2 minus ion, but it's starting to get quite confusing with the whole half equations and reduction oxidation and all the rest. Um, and I'll talk about the whole redox nature of this in a second. So, we turn our alcohol, ethanol, into ethanol. And this is, remember, an aldehyde. So, Let's look at this one here now. Oxidization, oxidation, I always say oxidization. Oxidation, what can we do? Same process as before, acidify potassium dichromate. We go down, what do we produce? Same thing again, or same process, I should say, rather than same thing. We turn, lose the hydrogens, oxygen comes from the oxidizing agent. And look at that. Now we have a ketone, and this is propanone, and that is a ketone. Okay, same process. This one here, no, no oxidation takes place. And if you look at it, it kind of makes sense why there aren't the hydrogens actually attached to the carbon to allow for oxidation to take place. Three alkyl groups, it's not going to work. So, Go down here, what can happen now? Well, we can get further oxidation taking place here, not here. Okay, down here, this can be further oxidized to what am I doing? Absolute buffoon. There we go, lapse there in concentration. And here we now have ethanoic acid. And this is obviously a, whilst I'm giving the, the kind of the specific examples here of ethanoic acid, ethanol and ethanol as we go up the, um, as we unoxidize, reduce them. Bear in mind, obviously you'd have various examples. You could have, whatever it is, propan one ol is your starting point and, and kind of working down. So please bear that in mind. Obviously, you've got to apply these ideas to the specific starting molecule. So, ethanol. I will just name all these as well, actually. And this one was what? 2 methyl. So, get oxidized further to a carboxylic acid. And you can see basically what we do here is we slot that oxygen in between here and the carbon hydrogen. We haven't got that carbon hydrogen here that allows us to do that, hence there is no further oxidation of a ketone, but there is the aldehyde. That's very important. At this point, what we could also say is, well, experimentally, how would we kind of, how would we produce these things? How do we actually get them? It's literally a case of heating um, the alcohol with some acidified potassium dichromate and you'll do this in an, and you should do this in a kind of it's a nice little experiment to do actually you heat them uh, you heat them together and you can do it under reflux really but you've got to be a bit careful that you don't want to the problem is if you if you really vigorously sort of add kind of loads of potassium dichromate 
to your ethanol, so I guess you could say it's sort of an excess potassium dichromate to the ethanol, and you heat it under reflux, which is an upside down condenser, you'll just oxidise, potentially go the whole way through to basically vinegar, and you should get that vinegary smell. If you're careful and you don't do it too strongly, the heat too strongly, and you dis you put set it up as a distillation, you can actually distill across um, the ethanol, and it smells like apples. So you can distill this across, okay? Um, you just got to careful that you don't obviously oxidize it further and further. That used to be an old school PSA, which is an old sort of little experiment you do, and, and I, I would guess a lot of schools will still do that. Um, and it leads us into the next bit, which is actually testing to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the preparation of these in an experimental sense. Um, it's, I mean, I've, I've, I've talked about it. I don't want to start writing too much down and it getting... Uh, bogged down too much. The key bit is this next part, uh, and it's so important. I'm going to change colour to. No, what do you something like that? Orange. Okay, so say we've got, I don't know, uh, an alcohol. We don't know whether what the alcohol, whether it's primary or secondary. And we oxidise it, okay? We oxidise it just enough so that if it was primary, it only stops at the aldehyde, and if it was secondary, it would stop at the ketone. And so we've distilled off some sort of product, but we don't know what it is. What we can do is we can test to distinguish between whether it is an aldehyde or a ketone. And there are two tests to use. The first is Tollens reagent. And the second is failings solution I'll start with failings because it's it's I think a little bit less sort of cool doesn't really do a lot failing solution in both of these situations aldehydes give a positive result ketones give a negative result and the reason is that I, I, I'll write down the equations of what's, what's going on in this equation here copper 2 plus is being broken down into copper or broken down, it's been reduced to copper plus and the colour change we see is basically blue solution to a brick red precipitate that tells us that we have an aldehyde okay that is oh god so much wrong with that there we go that is what the colour change we would get for an aldehyde. Ketone, we would see nothing, or we could say we'd have no visible change. Okay, no visible change. It would remain as this little blue solution. It's the same stuff really as Benedict's solution, which is used in biology quite a lot. Um, biologists love Benedict's testing for sugars and things. So, that's failing solution. Copper 2 plus is reduced to copper plus. Specifically, it's copper oxide, Cu2O, I think, that's formed. Uh, but it's the copper plus that gives it the colour. This way around, this is a simplified an equation because this isn't exactly how it looks. Uh, it's simplified. And this is the silver mirror test. Uh, what happens is the silver ions that we add in the Tollens reagent, it's ammoniacal silver solution or an ammoniacal silver complex. It's, in basic terms, the silver ions here, the Ag plus in the solution, are reduced to silver atoms uh, and so aldehyde what is it with spelling aldehyde um, silver mirror is formed I'm trying to what the starting color is here I think it might be colorless with our starting solution I've got a feeling it's a colorless solution to start with uh, and that turns to a silver mirror really really obvious really fantastic color change why do these processes occur? Well, in both forms here, we have reduction, and we have a reduction. Now, you may or may not have done a lot about redox, but the idea of reduction oxidation, when we have reduction occurring, we often find that it's coupled with oxidation occurring, and that allows for the electrons to be transferred from one to the other, um, which allows for reduction oxidation. Because the aldehyde is able to be further oxidized, it, in its oxidation there, losing electrons can ultimately donate these electrons to either the silver ions or to the copper ions allowing them to be reduced because reduction is gain of electrons so because the aldehyde can be oxidized the 
ions in solution can therefore be reduced causing us to have these nice color changes blue to lovely brick red precipitate and this silver mirror the ketone cannot be oxidized any further and because of that we therefore get no change we don't allow for these ions the silver ions or for the copper two plus ions to be reduced which is obviously very good and it means that we can distinguish between the two so back to what i was saying we've got these two alcohols one's primary one's one We've got an alcohol, sorry. Uh, we don't know if it's primary or secondary. We run the tests. We find that it does give a silver mirror once we've distilled off our oxidation product. That would tell us that it is a primary alcohol. Uh, if there was no result, it would have told us that it was a secondary alcohol to start with. So we can use it as a form of analysis, really, uh, which is quite nice. I'm going to look at a quick couple of exam questions, maybe just one exam question, actually, uh, give you an idea of how this could sort of be uh, tested uh, in an exam. Right, so this is uh, um, the paper from June 2009. It's a Unit 2 paper. Um, if obviously you're doing resits and things, then of the old school sort of AS, then you'll be sort of aware of these things. Uh, if you're on the new scheme, the new specification, I should say, um, these papers aren't perfect, but at the minute, particularly at this point where the video is being made, they're about the sort of as good as we can get. But the questions are going to remain similar. So state the class of alcohol to which butan 2 ol belongs. Here's my butan 2 ol Now we could draw it out, it's probably our easiest thing to do. Butan 2 ol 1, 2, 3, 4 for our butan 2 ol on the second here. One hydrogen there. Alkyl, alkyl, two alkyl groups, therefore it is going to be secondary. I'm not going to do this next question of the, of the infrared uh, spectrum, because I don't want it. Um, but I want to go on to this one. Draw the displayed formula. Displayed, very important. Must do OH like that. Draw the displayed formula with the alcohol C4H9OH, which is resistant oxidation by acidified potassium dichromate 6. So, one mark, easy mark. We're looking for um, a situation where we have three alcohol groups bound to our hydroxy group. I've drawn it at an angle. Um, I have no idea why. Do make sure that you include terribly drawn H's uh, like these. Awful, what is it? That doesn't even, that's not, I mean, that doesn't even look like any letter. Do make sure you include all the uh, subsequent bonds there. C4, H9, OH, let's have a quick check. One, two, three, four C's, good. H9, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, good. Yeah, because the OH there, I panicked there for a second. C4, H9, and then the OH is there, good. Oh, panicked. Uh, one mark. Nice. Uh, that's really the oxidation of alcohols done. Uh, I don't want to go into any sort of more detail or any more on that one. Any problems, any questions, stick them in the comments. Uh, otherwise, I hope that's been of some help to you.